All right. So today, what I'd like to do is dissect a bunch of, I think, great papers that used interviews somewhere uh, as part of their study design. Um, and the reason I'm doing this is because um, for me, I've always found that, oops, is that me? That's not gonna work. Kill Slack. Oh, no, that was me. Oh, that was you? Okay. <laughs> All right. <laughs> That's pretty good. Um, okay. I've always found it super useful to try to copy the way other people write or the way other people design their studies. Um, I that's always been an effective way for me to learn. Now your mileage may vary. You know, people uh, learn in different ways. They benefit from different forms of feedback. But to the extent that to some of you a similar approach would also be effective, I want to expose you to as much of that as I can. So we're really hopefully going to dissect and learn by osmosis these uh, great uh, papers so that we can do them on our own uh, afterwards. That's the idea. Um, and we're going to do that. We're going to talk a little bit about IRB uh, afterwards because uh, there were a few questions on Slack and I'll see if there's any questions I can answer here for everyone. Um, and I want to go back to the co-pilot blog post that you all commented on or most of you commented on um, I saw some really nice comments in there, and I want to sort of briefly bring those back to everyone and have a discussion at the end. Uh, hopefully, we managed to do all of this. If you haven't uh, started thinking about this already, uh, please remember there's a lit review homework that's due uh, tomorrow. If you need more time, we could discuss that. Um, but you know, please remember that this exists. Um, also, we've just released another homework assignment um, asking you to conduct two interviews, actually conduct two interviews using the protocol that you started working on in class last week, the one on studying collaboration and co-authorship uh, between people working on a paper together. Um, and the homework assignment is asking you to identify two interviewees, ideally two that have collaborated on the same paper, so you can get you know, different perspectives on that collaboration, um, and interview each one of them separately, so they're not you know you can so they can hopefully be honest about that experience, um, and to uh, audio record those interviews. Uh, so that we can later transcribe and analyze them. Um, and I'm going to ask you to also write up a couple of paragraph, uh, paragraphs of notes uh, to hand in as the actual homework assignment report. Uh, I won't collect all of your transcripts for obvious reasons um, or, or audio files for obvious reasons. Um, like, you know, I shouldn't have access to them necessarily because people only entrusted you with that data at best, not me. Uh, but your notes on how the interviews went and whatnot, things you learned, uh, that should be fine. fine. Yes. Uh, so two questions. One question, do we need to get like IRB approval for this or anything? Second question, are there limitations on who we can interview? Great questions. No, you do not need to get IRB approval for this. It is a class project. We do not need specifically, this is one of the scenarios that is laid out as exempt from uh, needing IRB approval. Uh, we're going to talk a little bit more about IRB later. Um, we do not need IRB for this, so it's, you know, it's easy enough to do. Um, anyone counts as an interviewee, you know, as long as they're, I don't know, faculty or grad student or a postdoc or some, someone, right? Uh, you know, anyone that has worked uh, on a research paper, say in the last year, counts as a potential interviewee in any department. They don't have to be here. Uh, and I would also encourage you to not interview the same, you know, people, have multiple groups or students interview the same people. So hopefully you can you know, get a diverse sample of interviews. I see people naming people already that they want to interview. So you can interview anyone, any faculty or student or postdoc or what have you. Um, ideally, it's two people that have worked on the same paper so that, you know, they share this experience. So you can maybe get different perspectives on that experience. 
um, but I don't need to know who they are. Uh, and you know, they don't need to know that you're talking to both of them, for example. Uh, you can tell them, but they don't need to know. Um, yeah. So you should keep part of your information on them. I don't, I don't care. I don't need to know who they are, but you can describe them to me. You can tell me, you know, a grad student, a faculty member, et cetera. Uh, I, I don't, it's, it's not useful for me to know, you know, specifically who they are. Uh, their role might be relevant when you report back, but I don't need to know who they are. Uh, Maddie. Oh, thanks. I was wondering if we should rule out people that we have collaborated with. Um, maybe um maybe if you can uh, that's probably wise because there's probably a lot of things you might be taking for granted when you talk to them or interview them because you already have this whole shared experience um and Maybe some of these challenges with interviewing a stranger won't show up as much and it won't be as useful a learning experience for you to do this. Okay. Um, if you can't find anyone else, then you know, okay. But mm -hmm. I think I think I would probably, you know, if given the choice, I would probably choose a relative stranger over a close connection. Okay, great. Okay. Anything else? Yeah. Sorry, what if they don't feel comfortable um do you take detailed notes instead of um, recording them yep so if we did like during the group activity actually finish the protocol are we supposed to like, yes finish it, finish it. yes thank you that's a good point so yeah please finish the protocol um and run it uh, with two people, I think preferably that have collaborated on the same paper and not necessarily with you, or may maybe best if not with you also on said paper. Is the, the class, uh, um, the one you wrote up there, is that online? Like last class you wrote what we were talking about on the screen. Oh, excellent. Yes, I did not post that, but I shall post that um, right after this class. Thank you. That is a great point. I, I wrote down all of the notes I collected from all of you um, when we discussed the interview protocol, when we workshop that together last class. Uh, and I will, I will post those in the slides for last class, which I did not update because we took the notes live during class uh, after I posted. Yep. Yeah. Thank you. That's a great point. So I shall do that. You, you you can do this any way you like. You can do this in groups, in any groups you like, or individually. I don't I don't really care. Mm -hmm. Whatever is most convenient for you. Do this however it's easiest for you. Um, by the way, word of advice, I would do this over Zoom because you automatically get the captions. If you set up, there's a setting in Zoom. I can show you where it is. Courtney figured this out before. She could show you where it is too. There's a setting in Zoom that you have to enable for automatic captions to be computed. Maybe you can post this in the Slack channel, Courtney, if you remember how you did this. Yeah. Um, so if you do a Zoom call with someone and um, tell Zoom to save the recording in the cloud, which is what I'm doing with these lectures, um, you automatically get a text file with the captions uh, that have been computed by some AI transcription service. Uh, so that's that's awesome because you get it for free and automatically. Uh, so I would, if I were you, I would try that first before trying other ways to do this because uh, then you don't have to worry about how you transcribe this. You get it for free. So I would I would run the interview as a Zoom call with whomever you're interviewing. I was going to mention alternatively, if you forget to turn on the Zoom transcription or don't have Zoom transcription, the service that Zoom uses is called otter.ai yep. and it's free. So you can run the transcription that way. Thank you. Perfect. I thought you had to pay for it. I didn't know it was free. I think but you that... can do a limited amount for free. I, I don't know for sure. We, we did that for a project. I, that's why I know. Okay, so hopefully that's another way to do it. There's another one that we've been using called Temi, I think T-E-M-I, Temi AI, 
it's Temi.ai or something that does the same thing. Um, I don't remember if it was free, but it was very, very cheap. Um, so that's another option. And, um, the, uh, the reason why I'm mentioning the transcripts uh, as something you wanna hold on to is because we're gonna do a qualitative thematic analysis on those next time uh, for next homework. So that's sort of, you know, it's good to have those transcripts as the uh, outcome. So I would prefer having somebody that's willing to be recorded so we can have the transcripts. So, you know, we have that bit of data rather than just detailed notes that you might take uh, as the interviewer. Okay. Okay, very good. Um, and last bit of thing here um, is if you haven't read the Learning from Strangers, chapter four, uh, the one with lots of examples of interview protocols and transcripts that went awry or you know, interviews that went really well, definitely look at those examples because they're really informative uh, for you know, how you might run these interviews yourself. It's a short chapter, you can read it very quickly. It's very informative and useful. Uh, and finally, if you haven't talked to me or Bobo about project proposal ideas, uh, please think about doing that so we can advise you on those so you are on a good path going forward. Okay, so let's see. I'm thinking we do this in uh, some order. I know I'm very insightful today. Let's see. I let's start with the wash paper, just because it's the oldest. Yeah. Actually, uh, no. Well. Does that work for you, Maddie? I'm ready. Yeah, sure. Okay, so we'll do the usual thing where we uh, have the uh, people who volunteered uh, to present, just briefly summarize the paper and tell us some thoughts on this. And then we have some discussion about what you all uh, thought about the paper. Hopefully everybody has had a chance to at least look at the papers. I see, I see awkward faces. <laughs> okay, all right, Maddie. I have slides, but I can just, I don't need, they don't, I have slides, but I don't know if there's a way to share yeah, them. I can stop sharing. You can just okay. directly, I think if you share your screen, you should be able to. Oh, great. Okay. Cool. I think we can hear you. Right? Great. Okay. Um, all right. So this paper is called Folk Models of Home Computer Security. It was shared in 2010 in a symposium on usable privacy and security. Um, I, I chose this paper because it's set to write about or to read in greater detail because it seems like um, it really is unique in how much detail it goes into how they did interviews. And I really appreciated that. Um, the rationale behind writing this paper, as we might imagine from the name of the symposium, is really about designing better security technologies that acknowledge the realities of how most people or non-expert users actually use computers and software. Um, so the author is trying to contribute to that effort to design software that is usable and can make um, uh, our network of computers safer and more secure. Um, the research questions guiding his work are, how do home computer users conceptualize the information security threats that they face? And how do these users apply mental models um, to make decisions about uh, home computer security? Uh, for folks, people who didn't read the paper, a folk model is really the object of study here. Um, it's a subtype or a subgroup of mental models that the author identifies as being relevant in this space, um, acknowledging that these models are real and alive and valid for those who hold them, um, but objectively or outside of those individuals' reality, there may be something incorrect about those models, or it might not reflect the actual um, truth or reality of what's happening in that situation. So they can lead to erroneous decision-making, but they are some can be somewhat shared within a culture. The author felt like um, he should do this work on folk models and home security and uh, non-expert users. 
because while there was literature about the beliefs that non-expert uh, users hold about home security, he felt that there was a gap in mental model understanding. And that gap is meaningful because mental models, he argues, um, will inform how we make decisions and decision-making is an important part of home computer security. So he studies mental models, again, folk models in this group of people to understand how decisions are made and the implications that might have for the design of software. There's some urgency that the author cites in why we need this information because botnets are a new category of security threat uh, that have the, you know, do a lot of harm. And the author argues that home security users are in a particular position to spread and support the work of the malicious work of botnets. Um, and this may be a threat that is totally not covered by the mental models these users might have. Uh, getting into the study design, because again, this is about mental models with non-expert users, he chose to do semi-structured interviews in two rounds. He bounded the geography by saying three Midwestern cities where he had personal connections. Um, his recruitment method was to just do personal outreach to individuals that he knew were a non-expert computer users, and then he asked for references. Um, once he had interviewed them saying, are there other people who also fall in this category? So he called that a snowball approach to recruitment. And he did do screening before uh, including people in the study to make sure that they were truly non-experts and did not have formal training. He argues that he sort of informally kind of foraged or cultivated a group that he felt was representative of a sort of average American user across different uh, age and socioeconomic groups. He did these interviews face-to-face -face, um, and as semi-structured conversations. His first round was with 23 people and he did a preliminary analysis of those um, interviews to gain some sort of initial hypotheses or um, initial conclusions. He said that see, he said that in the in his interviews, the way he really spent his time was actually asking very uh, few probing questions, but then spending a lot of the time on follow ups to go dig deeper and really develop a nuanced understanding of how people were making decisions about computer security. Um, he then did a clever thing, I thought, which was he used 10 more interviews to sort of test his initial hypotheses. And he made use of hypothetical scenarios during these interviews to really look for um, situations that might refute his initial hypotheses or to gain greater resolution into them. And I will not describe specifically the mental models and things that he learned about, but he felt like, or the author argued that this research is important and makes a meaningful contribution because uh, fundamentally, it helps us understand why users may strictly follow some security advice and ignore other advice, perhaps suggesting that we need to be giving different advice or designing our security systems differently. Great. Yeah, thanks a lot. This is great. So did you see, let me put back, let me take this back or rather, well, maybe I should take this back here. And do this again. And now, uh, yeah. So did you see how they, uh, or the author, um, ran these so two rounds of interviews? So this is really a take home message for us. Okay, so, you know, he started with some protocol. Do you, do you know, Maddie, the protocol is public? Is it part of the study somewhere? Can we see the actual questions? I don't think so. Yeah. Okay. 
So, Maybe yeah, there's an well. appendix that I missed. No, I don't think he actually says his questions. So, and sometimes people publish the protocols too, but I guess not in this case. So he started with some protocol and he ran a bunch of interviews, 23 in this case, and he stopped, he paused there and he went through all of the things that all the data that he collected from those 23 interviews and, and did some preliminary ana analysis to see kind of what's coming up, what's emerging. And then he tweaked the set of questions uh, and ran another set of 10 to you know, further probe or validate or whatever, the things that came out of this initial analysis. So this pattern of, sort of iterative data collection and analysis and then more data collection and more analysis, this is very common for this kind of research and it's always a good idea uh, because the risk otherwise is that you, know, you run you know, 33 instead of 23 um, and you've learned that you should have asked different questions, right? And you only learned that at the very, to me, 23 is late. So I would have done this preliminary thing earlier. Like uh, 23 seems like a lot of work to do before thinking about what you've done. Yep. Yeah, that was what I was gonna ask. Like, it, it was surprising to me that it, it I was expecting when, when I was saying, oh, there's like two phases. I was like, okay, probably the first phase had like the minority of the interviews, the second phase had the majority. Yeah. Like what's the intuition for getting that really long? Yeah. Um, so you actually, once we get to the sex workers paper, you will see another really good example of how they do this. If I remember correctly, they did that in uh, increments of five. Uh, so it's a much shorter cycle of iteration and kind of, you know, revisiting and seeing what they're learning and then going back and, you know, slightly tweaking things depending on that. So I, I would have, if it were me, I would have done this sooner, uh, but still it's a really good idea to do this, uh, you know, at all. The other thing that was interesting, what so how did the author sample the interview thoughts on that or opinions? What is the snowball approach? Especially, let's see, somebody from a culture that's not accustomed to snow. I'm from Alabama. Courtney's from Florida, that counts. Um, <laughs> it's where you start with like you find some people and then you who they know and then who those people know so it's like apparently what happens with the snow while going down the hill. <laughs> <laughs> I love it. Yeah. So if you've ever built a snowman, typically you know, a, a way that people build snowmen, yeah, snow people I should say, is you start with a small ball that you shape with your hands and then you just roll that ball in the grass or whatever on the ground. And as you're rolling it, you know, the snow just sticks to it and it grows bigger and bigger uh, until it's, you know, big enough. And then you, you know, that becomes your half of your snow person or whatever. You then make another one and, you know, have two stacks on top of each other. So the idea is that you start with this, you know, core of a few friends of yours, right? Or whatever, people the author knew uh, and then expand from that with people they know and they recommend in turn and you know you, you keep doing this maybe potentially uh, multiple hops right you can ask for those people's connections you know and interview those as well etc right, so that's sort of the idea with the snowball approach um, it's very common but is what do you think of it like is it ideal would you when when is it good when is it less good yep i was gonna say i think it's especially useful when you're looking at something that's like low base rate in the population where you're not going to necessarily have like a need. A great example is like looking at like populations like blind people or uh, sex workers where it may be difficult to recruit people. By just random sampling or something. Yeah. yeah. And what's the risk with this? Is there any? You, yep. you might, oh. you might, uh, the diversity of answers might be more limited than you think it is. Um, yeah, you might think your sample is more representative of the whole world, but it's actually just a little, yeah. a little corner. That's right. I agree, right? So if you happen to start with the Republicans, you know, chances are all their friends will also be Republicans and so on. So like you will only get, you know, half of the perspective, say, right? Even in the end, once you've interviewed everybody, um, or you know, Democrats in the other direction will be the same effect. Uh, for example, right, people are very polarized, and you know, their connections and friends and whatnot tend to share the same views that they share. So there's a real risk that by doing this, you miss out on a lot of the uh, viewpoints and whatnot that 
may not be widely shared right uh, across that sub community that's always that's always a risk it's good to be aware of this all right very good um the other thing i wanted to just highlight here briefly um i also chose this paper because i thought it was well written so i wanted to highlight a few simple clear sentences from the introduction where the author sets up what what do we call the heuristic for writing i don't know lit reviews or introductions what do we call it hook was part of it what else problem gap hook three components right? what is the problem what is the gap in our understanding collective knowledge about the problem and who cares what's the hook why should i care about this okay so all of these papers and i think i've tried to highlight a few sentences from each of them uh do this in a really simple and really effective way i thought so i wanted to expose you to these simple clear sentences so that you can hopefully you know absorb them and replicate them in your own research you know with the appropriate context uh, switching okay so home users are installing patent free home security software at a rapidly rapidly increasing rate so it creates this sense of urgency for the research right this already the hook half the hook is here uh, nonetheless security intrusions and the cost they impose on other network users are also increasing to design better security technologies, we need to understand how users make security decisions and to characterize the security problems that result in these decisions. So that's the hook. Okay. Uh, and then whatever, the author investigates this or that. Um, there's a bunch of research questions. And here's also more of the hook. Many of these problems extend beyond the home likely to generalize to a whole class of users who are unsophisticated in their security decisions, such as university computer users, small business users, computer users, et cetera. So A, there's, you know, there's a clear reason why we should care about understanding or uh, fixing this problem for the set of users that are affected by it, but B, this also likely extends much beyond the population that was studied in this paper. Right? So you should you know, even more care about this paper because you're learning something not only about the class of people that have been studied explicitly, but also probably about you know, all kinds of other people that uh, you know, are similar to them in, in some ways. And you know, those ways are made explicit. Okay, so that's a, that's a double hook, right? It's a hook for the population uh, under study. And then an even you know generalizability argument, which is very rare, right? We rarely do that. Uh, we rarely dare to make claims about uh, other populations than the ones studied. Uh, and the author does that here. And, you know, it's a very powerful thing to do. Okay, so I think any more thoughts on on this overall? We talked about the iteration. We talked about snowballing uh transcription yeah so we talked about all that yeah you mentioned earlier that the interview protocol is not available why why would someone not make their interview protocol not available uh because it was 2010 <laughs> and uh nobody did this back then it was just not common practice um i sometimes people do sloppy interviews so <laughs> I'm going to go off on a rant for just a second. Um, there is this mixed methods mafia. You hear about this? Uh, at the software engineering conferences, people speak of this of the uh, mixed methods mafia, which is this uh, kind of like the deep state. This group of people, reviewers, that keep insisting that all studies be mixed methods, uh, and uh, you know for no good reasons apparently. And the authors are not convinced, you know, that the papers get rejected for, you know, not including a survey or interviews or whatever, only being based on some, I don't know, quantitative analysis. And then the authors are angry. Uh, and, you know, next time they resubmit the paper, they staple on some crappy, poorly done, you know, interview or survey or something. Uh, not because it makes sense to the study or, you know, it adds any knowledge or triangulates or does anything useful you know, fundamentally to the study, but because they think it's going to be easier to get a, the paper past peer review. Uh, so, you know, maybe in scenarios like that, people would be less 
are inclined to share their protocols because you, know, you would immediately tell that they were crappy. Uh, so you know they don't want that. Uh, but I think by and large, um, people these days do share their stuff. Uh, it's just that the culture wasn't that uh, in 2010. End of round. A lot of old papers don't have protocols. <laughs> yeah. Um, I did share, so in the same drive folder, and I told you about this last time, I shared at least four, I think, uh, papers with protocols attached to them in the appendix at the end. So you can see what some actual protocols look like. Uh, it will help you for, for example, designing or finalizing the one on collaboration and running the interviews, uh, as well as, you know, for other purposes. Uh, sorry, there was a question. Oh, yeah, so do you like editors or office chairs ever overrule any of these types of things? Um, sometimes, but um, the decision is needs to be made by consensus among the reviewers. Um, it's usually um, not the case that somebody steps in to overrule some consensus decision between the three typically reviewers. Even if they have the power to do that, they typically don't because it's sort of against the you know core principle of peer review that you know it has to be kind of the consensus of the expert reviewers. Um, even if you disagree with them and you maybe have good reasons, it's kind of bad practice to. Would they ever say something before like the reviewing process and say, please don't reject the paper just because you disagree? Yes, yes. So, um, side rant again. Uh, if you look at the uh, ICSI conference, the software engineering top conference, the uh, organizers have put out some 200 page document um, or presentation with instructions for the program committee members, the reviewers uh, that include, you know, all of these kinds of things, you know, good and bad reasons for rejecting papers, et cetera. So there's, you know, there's, there's a lot of training. Do people do all of it? So you have to remember that um, for a conference as big as ICSI, there's some 200 people on the program committee uh, in every year. Uh, I think at NURIS, which is a gigantic thing, the number is probably much greater than that. I think that they have thousands. Been people have been trying to make comments. So like ICSI is more. Um, random people don't ever make comments. The reviewers themselves hardly ever make comments. If you've ever submitted to NeurIPS, you would know that they don't even respond to your rebuttal uh, <laughs> or acknowledge that you responded. So, you know, I think the scale is just so huge that it's uh, beyond manageable. This is the problem of <laughs> Okay, but that's a that's a longer rant. We can maybe take this yeah, off. Um, let's go to the Software engineering Twitter paper. Who did we have? Who's our victim for this? Do you want to jump on a call or? Yeah, do you, what do you I'm already on. You're already on? Perfect. And do you. Let's see what the audio is like. I'm not sure. You should be able to share, right? At this point. Yes. I think so. And is it going through your mic or mine? Uh, one second. Because if it's going through mine, make a mess. Test, test, test. Test, test. That's good. There you go. Test, test. Uh, Maddie or anybody on Zoom? Uh, sounds good. Sounds good. Okay, okay, perfect. Let's go. Sure. Okay, okay so, so I'm Eli, and I did the paper on Twitter and software engineering. To start, to start I'll talk about the problem yeah. gap in the hook. Uh -huh. And, and what, what the authors, authors mention is that, is that the problem is software engineering is such a rapidly evolving field that it's extremely difficult to keep up with the new um, innovations in it. And developers are constantly seeking ways of using technology to help them with that. And so we know uh, how developers are using tools like Stack Overflow and email and blogs to keep up with the changing technology but we don't know anything about Twitter in specific. 
So that, that's the gap. And then for the hook, uh, the authors generalize and say, understanding why and how people use Twitter in the software engineering context would shine a light on the general needs and challenges faced by developers. And it would also help shape the design for better tools in the future uh, for keeping up with changing technology. The high level study design is a grounded theory approach where they do a bunch of data collection and then construct local theories and hypotheses based on that data. And like we mentioned with the previous study, it's an iterative data collection and analysis process. And those iterations are um, come in the form of an exploratory survey with 271 people recruited from GitHub and then interviews, which were people who volunteered to participate in that from the survey respondents and then a final validation survey sent out to GitHub. And as far as mixed methods go, uh, it was mostly qualitative data collection, but they did quantify um, some of the results in the survey, which were Likert scale questions. They also quantify some of the reasons people gave for not using Twitter. And the research questions they came up with orbit around how and why people use Twitter and why they choose not to as well. They're all seem to be exploratory or base rate questions for this study. And then getting into the details of the interviews, they conducted 27 via Skype. 93% of their interviewees were professional developers, um, but they came from a variety of geographic regions and they had a variety of account ages so the authors claim there is some diversity in this population. Also, some of them uh, used Twitter and some of them didn't. And that's another part of the, their contribution. The interview guide uh, is provided. Uh, they're in the, not in the appendix, but they cite it as a separate source. And they formed their interview questions with uh, extremely warm introduction they were like, wow, thank you so much for joining our interview. Then they ask some demographic questions like, are you a professional developer? Uh, how often do you use Twitter? And then they go into first general actions on Twitter and their interview guide looks like they'll have this main header, which will say like, you post on Twitter because dot, 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 question mark. And so that will be their main question. And then they'll have subheaders, which were like, and do you think your followers get any useful information from your posts? It was kind of an accusatory tone when I was reading it, but I could just be having too much fun. Um, and then they ask specific questions about their interactions, like who is this specific person you follow and why do you follow them? And then they extrapolate from there and say, who are the general types of people you follow? And I highlighted a couple of questions I thought were interesting, which they said, uh, they asked, what is the coolest thing that happened to you on Twitter? And do you see any problems on Twitter that others might have, even if you don't have them? I thought that was a creative way of getting more information. And to highlight a couple of interesting results, um, they took all of that data and then I think, what do they call it? An axial coding. So they categorized the answers into like activities and impacts and challenges and strategies. So they named like four of each and they said an activity would be following a thought leader in your field and an impact of doing that would be dissemination of knowledge. And for challenges, they would say a challenge is keeping up with this seemingly infinite news feed, uh, consuming content, and a strategy would be skimming by profile picture, which people actually admitted to doing, funnily enough. And I think, oh yeah, I highlighted one more interesting result, which is several participants preferred Google Plus. And I just found that interesting because <laughs> Google Plus quickly failed. But that was it. Yeah, awesome. Thanks a lot. This is great. I, I really appreciate sort of diving into the protocol uh, and sort of highlighting. Thanks a lot.
Uh, okay, let me. Smartphone connected. <clears throat> Not really what I was going for, but. How about now? My back. Yeah, we can hear you. Perfect. All right. So yeah, I want to highlight just a couple of things. Uh, this was a great summary, so thank you. I, I don't have a lot to add. So the uh, did you see how? Did you notice how um, simple and clear the whole problem gap book argument was? Like you know, hey, there's this. Everything has changed, and there's this new thing, and we have no idea what's going on. And it has really clear implications, both both for. Um, let me see. What did they say? Here, it has really clear implications, both for uh, understanding people's needs uh, and future research in this area, as well as for building better tools to support them. Uh, and they talk about some concrete things, presumably at the end, some examples of these. Okay, so I guess what I'm trying to say is um, a good argument is often a simple argument. To the extent that you can, you know, simplify or extract the core of the arguments you're trying to make in your papers by you know, clearly identifying some knowledge gap uh, and arguing why it's important to fill it. I think you've won over your reviewers. Uh, Enough by then. By the way, another rant. Since we're in rant mode, I love this. I should get, should get uh, I don't know, drinks or something. I love this. So, um, do you know how peer review works? You ever talked about this? In in that, let, let's say for a you know top venue, uh, a member of the program committee, a reviewer, uh, gets assigned in our field in software engineering some ten to fifteen papers to review over the course of some six to eight weeks. So about a month and a half to two months. Okay, so you have to review, say 15 papers in less than two months. Okay, so you, you sort of have to do about two a week on average while you're, you know, teaching class and, you know, writing your own papers and, I don't know, writing grants and you know whatever else you're doing because you have a full-time job, right? Uh, as a all of these people are faculty members typically somewhere or working like industry research labs and have full-time jobs or whatever. Okay. Um, nobody gets paid anything extra for this, right? So it's something that you do, you know, get when? When do you get to do this? You know, after you've done all the things that pay your bills. Right, so you know you go to you know you go to work, you teach class, you prep class, you you know help your students edit their papers before submission, whatever else you do, like tons of things. You go to faculty meetings, like do all the things you do anyway, and then you know you're grumpy and tired, and you get home in the evening, and you're like, oh, I have these 15 papers to review for you know XC. Like, oh. Right, so like picture yourself in this mode where you're exhausted, and it's you know 9 p.m. or whatever. Uh, and you like, you know, pull this paper and you start reviewing it. Right? So that's the, that's the mindset typically. Okay? So like what happens? Like if the paper is, you know, well written and if it hooks you from page one, which is where this argument usually is, you know, what's the problem? Why is it important? What's the knowledge gap? You know, who cares about filling it? If, if the paper hooks you on page one, I think that's, you know, more than half the battle won. Like it doesn't even matter what you do in the paper anymore, right? By then, because the reviewer is excited, right? So you sort of take in this person that is otherwise grumpy and tired, maybe having a glass of wine or whatever. You're taking that person uh, and you're putting them in a positive frame of mind. You're like, oh yeah, that sounds interesting. Uh, you know, let me read this. That sounds interesting. Whereas if you start with something that does not make any sense, right? It only makes you know this person's mindset worse because they're already grumpy and tired and have you know. Uh, not really much interest in you know doing this. They just do it because they have to. Okay, so you know, please do not underestimate the human behind the process. Right? Don't just assume it's some I don't know objective AI or whatever. Um, 
that does not suffer from any of these human challenges, uh, challenges. Right, so to keep that in mind when you're writing. So that's why writing simple, clear arguments like these is really useful, right? It will you know, turn your great work otherwise into something that other people appreciate more easily. Okay, end of rant. Uh, the other thing I wanted to mention here, yes, yeah, so the other thing that was interesting to me here is the overall study design. So this was really clever and I rarely see something that's this elaborate. This was a lot of work. So um, a huge online survey that they sent to over a thousand people, they got, I don't know, 270 responses back and they analyzed all of that data uh, and they went and they did a second round of interviews with people from the survey to ask them more stuff, right? So, you know, this talks a little bit about how, and we talked about this before, about how, you know, to, to a lot, large extent, open-ended survey questions are kind of like interview questions. So they can be used interchangeably, except there's no opportunity to follow up when you just ask the survey. Right, so this is a good example of that limitation, right? They wanted to follow up. There was a lot more they wanted to ask and know and whatever, right? And, you know, people didn't provide enough information in the survey. So they went back and they interviewed a bunch of people, right? Um, about all of these additional things that they wanted to learn about. And that provided a lot more richness to the data they were able to collect. But really, you know, clever use of the two methods here. Um, and then, they analyzed all of this data, came up with a list of research questions, five research questions, okay? And then they did a, com they did a completely different survey okay? sent to 10,000 people. They got 1,200 responses back, completely different survey, just to validate the things they had hypothesized after running the first survey. Okay, so that's a ton of work, right? So this is just one paper. Think about how much work went into this, into this one paper. Uh, and, you know, as a result, I think this was a very impactful paper. So the authors could have easily stopped and tried to publish just the first survey alone, right? They could have easily stopped there and tried to publish that. And often you see papers like these that just, you know, do something, uh, but it's relatively small and they always leave you wanting more, right? They, so they didn't do that. They resisted the temptation to you know, publish the short, easy thing. And they put in the work to do this, you know, comprehensive, deep analysis, you know, lots of methods, triangulation, validation, et cetera, much nicer piece of work, like something to be proud of. So that's the other morale of today's story. You know, don't go after the easy stuff, put in the time to do something more meaningful, even if it takes longer. Yeah, Sam. How many authors do we have in this paper? Uh, how many is in the Eli, do you know? I don't know. So. I guess I'm just curious because I remember there was like a discussion. Three. Three? Yeah, you, they're here. So uh, the last one is the faculty member. Uh, I think Life Singer was a postdoc at the time. Hmm. I don't know the middle author. Right. I, yeah, I, I guess I'm, I'm just curious because like I remember there was a discussion at AC this year um, where a bunch of the, like a bunch of the, a bunch of faculty members or faculty we're talking about this kind of topic of like we have a whole bunch of like easy science or like you know low effort sciences because of like the drive to like publish like more and more papers etc. Um, and so like all these professors like came up and talked about this and then like there was a Q and A session afterwards and like a couple of, like PhD students came up and they're like they're like oh this is like super easy for you to say as like tenured faculty members but how do we like this incentives are not aligned for us to do this as students. This is a myth. This is a myth. It is not true. I, I strongly believe this. It is not true that less frequent but more meaningful, deeper work will not get more recognition than high frequency, shallower work. I've never seen evidence of that. In fact, I've only seen evidence of the contrary. And these are the kinds of papers that you know win awards and get people you know tenure track jobs and whatever else. 
they you know have a lot of impact on the field win impact award 10 years later for having had a lot of impact on the field it's not the quick easy shallow high frequency papers that do that it's you know these ones that take years that, that end up doing this so it's really not true it's not true um, by the way also just as an aside um the uh today is in like rat mode i don't know i don't know. must have been something in the lunch they put something in the salad i, I should stop going to each unique like <laughs> so, I don't know what's going on. Um, the CRA guidelines, uh, which arguably nobody follows except us here. So, so take that with a grain of salt. No other university that I know follows this. Um, so you know that's maybe where the myth comes from. But the CRA guidelines say that you know when you go out for uh, faculty job, apply for faculty jobs, or go out for promotion and tenure, all those kinds of things, you use as part of your package for these milestones, uh, something like three publications, three. You choose from your many, the three that you think are most you know, impactful or representative of your work or whatever, three, right? So not 300, three. So it doesn't matter how many, you have, as long as you have at least three, <laughs> as long as you have at least three you know, over that period, according. I will not answer this question. <laughs> That is a trick question. I will not answer this question. Well, I guess because I remember you, you brought this up as in that discussion at it's um the same like guidelines which matter, like which universe is called. But I'm like as you say, like this kind of paper like takes years. Right? Yeah. So if a PhD takes like let's say five or six years, so you do like three. three. You do three. Right. But you they, they're great. Yeah. I think that I think that's better. I just spent the last year working on like one, one and a half papers. But how long did it take us to get that paper, the Twitter paper published at XC? How long did it take us? Like when, when did we start working on that and how long did it take? Probably one and a half year ago. At least, right? Yeah. Yeah, good yeah, the time I worked on slides, I wanted. <laughs> <laughs> Yeah, so that was a one and a half to two year paper. And I think it was a great paper. But so I think meaningful deep work takes time and effort and you know perseverance. And I think collectively we should resist the urge to just do shallow stuff with high frequency. Um, I, I understand that this is riskier, right? Because like, what if they don't pan out? Like, what if you put in two years and it doesn't work out, right? You're better off having spent six months and having four papers, you know, in the same amount of time, shallower papers, uh, than having one over two years that doesn't work out for whatever reason. So, I, I mean, I understand it's high risk, but it's also higher reward. Okay, uh, end rant <laughs> for now. Lunch. The lunch is still kind of working its way through me, so who knows? There might be more, yeah. So I just wanted in terms of what you were saying high reward. Um, like a counter argument is that I guess some people count like look at rewards differently. If you're doing some very high frequency thing, like the hottest field in ML, for example, um, you might get more citations if you do something that's just exactly like everyone else, because there's immediately like you're working on something like transformers, there's 20 papers on transformers every month. And you know, there, not everyone's going to look at that as lower impact, even though it made less of a splash in the conference. Yeah. But so, um, yes, I, I agree. But it doesn't it doesn't mean that so yeah, ML moves faster than most disciplines. I agree. Um, their papers are also shorter on average, um, so it's easier to write them more frequently because they're on average shorter. Um, I agree, you have to adjust to the you know uh, field you're in. Uh, but I think the same argument fundamentally holds everywhere that you're better off working on more meaningful stuff over you know shallower stuff with higher frequency. I think that argument at its core is not SE specific. Like it's the same argument would hold in ML and any other field. Even though on average, their frequency is much higher than ours. I don't think the argument is invalidated by their overall higher frequency. Uh, they also, you know, have lots of students and, you know, maybe bigger operations. Like, I don't know. It's, uh, 
it's often the uh, really big labs that can afford to do this because they have access to all this compute. The smaller places that can't do this as much. Uh, so like, you know, there's a lot of things there too, right? That kind of uh, advantage some groups over others, right? To be able to, to do this. Okay. Um, let's do another one. Let's do the sex workers paper. Uh, I love this paper. It was one of the most thorough interview papers I've ever read. It was fantastic. Uh, who, who do we have on the hook for this? Uh, that would be me. I will share perfect. my screen. Yeah. All right. Hello, everyone. Um, so this paper was presented at the CHI conference. Oh, can you guys see my... We're going to put you up in a second if I find the right uh, button. How's this? Does that work? I think it looks good to me. I'm trying to look at the little little image of you guys. Look like tiny people. Okay. So um, this uh, this paper was presented last year at the CHI conference. Um, oops, wait a minute. Got to the hook too fast. Sorry about that. Okay. Um, so the, the paper, you know, provides a solid foundation for why this problem is so important. There's, you know, just, it's a pretty significant amount of people in the world that are classified as sex workers. Um, but there's, you know, almost no literature within the HCI community. So, you know, these, um, these workers also tend to be marginalized and stigmatized. Um, they may or may not work in a country that um, where it's legal, and even if it is legal, they might have you know some type of migrant status. Um, so, a lot of these workers are are dealing with layers of different problems. Um, and then, lastly, and I think these interviews themselves will kind of highlight um, that you know there is a problem of discrimination within the digital sphere. Um, and so, you know, the hook is that there's just almost no data on this problem. Um, and so coming up with like, you know, a very foundational approach to just talking to sex workers and figuring out how they engage with um, technology um, to mediate their, their business would really push this forward in terms of uh, contributing to literature. And so, you know, the research question is very broad. How do sex workers use technology? Um, and what's really interesting is that um, through the study design piece, um, these researchers kind of went in blind. And so, you know, they added components to their research question technologies to really focus on by first doing some homework. So, you know, first they looked at four different sex forums um, and they essentially um, created a code book to find what the common lingo is um, with this, within this domain. And so they're able to really focus on advertising, client management, and payments as um, bigger things to really focus on. The ethics um, considerations were really built throughout the study design. So um, the team hired a sex worker consultant to really um, review every process of the design. So um, he or she was involved in, you know, overseeing the interview protocol to make sure there's nothing offensive. In addition to looking at the recruitment flyers, um, you know, of course there was a, an ethics board review. Uh, these considerations were also part of why the team decided to focus on an end-to-end -end um, encryption chat service as the interview medium. They also collected no personal information. Um, and so, you know, the interview does, the interview paper does high, at a high level explain that, you know, there were um, participants of, that identified with 
different sexual orientations that had different countries of origin uh, that had different ages. They don't actually really specify that information, um, you know, in a, in a structured way. Um, and that was for, you know, ethical considerations. Um, and one last note on this, which um, this was really interesting to me. The paper does name and shame um, platforms that discriminate against sex workers. So, you know, if we're going back to, um, you know, what, what kind of um, approach people have when they research, I thought this was actually a really good example of like an advocate or a critical theorist, um, you know, just because these um, researchers really do take a stand on this issue um, in wanting to change the way that these workers are treated um, with digital software. So it's just, um, just a note. And um, as to the interviews themselves, um, because everything was on, you know, um, a digital forum, they were able to do some audio conversion to chat transcripts and, you know, using another iterative open coding process, they were able to come up with a code book with which they recoded all of the interview um, answers to kind of group together cluster responses. Um, so the recruitment, they're very particular and careful with how they recruited um, you know, participants. It's just a very sensitive subject. So you know, um, they used three main approaches and they did note that while um, uh, participant sampling, snow, snowball sampling, so to speak, or the, where they used the use of referral incentives, I think they gave them like, an extra 10 euros if a participant was able to uh, recruit somebody else. Um, they only limited this to 10% of their participants just because you know they didn't want to have such a biased um, participants pool. So they also worked through brothels um, and um, they gave themselves plenty of time for recruitment just because it is hard to recruit sex workers that are actually willing to, to talk to people, even in countries that are legal. So like that was an important um, design for this was that they only recruited in Germany and Switzerland. Um, they were able to recruit about 29 workers and each worker was paid about the equivalent of $78 um, for an interview that ranged between 30 minutes and I think the longest was like two hours. Um, so even within their end-to-end -end, um, encryption platform, they were able to offer what people were most comfortable using, whether it was chat or voice or video, you know, because really the end goal was the content um, and to make people as amenable to these interviews as possible. Um, and additionally, they're able to, to do these interviews both in English and German. So I included a, a snapshot of the appendix. Um, the semi-structured process of this, um, they had a lot of you know, structured questions with a lot of prompts to make sure that the interviewers were really hitting all of the questions that they needed to. Um, but additionally, you know, they asked a lot of open-ended questions because um, the point of this design was to to really fill in this gap that nobody has asked and to you know try not to have too many assumptions going into the process um and so you know payment and vetting and how sex workers maintain their connections to their clients um in addition to just more interesting and broad um questions you know how has um being a sex worker changed your online and offline personas. Um, it's just a really interesting way to collect uh, broad information. Um, and, and to finish up, some just a few interesting findings. Um, you know, the interviews do reveal that platforms are prone to discriminating based on profession alone. So, you know, there were a few anecdotes of 
workers who had Instagram profiles and were kicked off even, you know, even though these were like personal profiles, as soon as these platforms, um, you know, kind of link together those entities, um, they'll just kick uh, these workers right off these platforms. And um, a big problem that this paper highlighted was kind of this idea of the exportation, exportation of American moral values to the international market, just because these platforms, most of them are Western alone. Um, and so the paper does mention this um, sex trafficking law that was passed under the Trump administration that you know, was um, pushed as a way to empower, I guess, um, sex trafficking victims, but this law makes no distinction between, um, you know, sex workers and um, people that are, you know, involuntarily sex trafficked. Um, and so it just kind of hits everybody with a, this blunt, um, blunt object and really penalizes sex workers that are working in legal countries um, those workers still get kicked off these platforms. Um, so yeah, that was um, pretty much an overview of my paper, if anyone has questions. Cool, yeah, thanks a lot. Thoughts? On the study design or if the, seems like insane amount of care they put into collecting this data. Methodologically, it's interesting because I'm like, I papers like this that work on similar things I'm working on trying to like research the privacy needs of a similarly like underground population. And so reading things like this, which have potential methodological designs is helpful for thinking about ways to do that. Yeah. Yeah, I, I really like um, how they've optimized uh for data quality over everything else like they've, they've come up with these accommodations uh anything you can imagine just so that they could get the best data they could uh, to make people as uh, willing to participate in the first place as, as willing to uh, contribute the information and whatnot to produce um, as possible uh, you know different languages whatever like all of this stuff um, was really great. And I also really liked the fact that they uh, hired a practitioner consultant, paid consultant on the research project just to make sense of their research protocol. Like, when did we ever do this on you know, any of our interview studies? Um, you know, I thought it was a really exemplar uh, interview study in that they've come up with things that I hadn't even considered were you know, things that one could do to uh, to run these anyway the other thing that i liked about this let's see if i can yeah the other thing i liked about this is and i think this is a lot more typical in uh, the hci community is that they uh let's see uh, oh yeah so we talked about this before this was the paper where um, the interviewers met after approximately every five interviews to check their understanding of the data and things like this uh, reevaluate refine uh, change things in the protocol and then go back and do more interviews so it's again this iterative process, uh, but every five here instead of uh, every twenty-three in the first one. Yeah. So this was the part I wanted. Yeah. 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 Checking. I don't know. I don't know if updating. Checking. Checking to. I. Um, I don't read this as implying that every five it needed to be changed, uh, but only that every five they checked and you know they changed it and updated it when needed. But I suspect that at some point it became stable and they just ran with it. 
Right, but it is a direct change of key. Then the data we collect from the smart card participants might be slightly different from the yes. Yes, uh, but but that's a that's okay. That's a good thing because it, instead of thinking that your early data uh, is, is worse, you could think that your later data is better. It's just a matter of framing, right? Like, it's better to change than to continue doing something poorly. I think is the philosophy. Yeah, yeah, I think so too. Uh, but like with the coding and all that, it might not. There might not be. That's a great comment, except quantitative analyses of qualitative data are rarely done. That's rarely the goal. Uh, the goal is to you know, find instances of all of these things in the universe, but not to count them, it's to describe them. Getting a distribution of how long data has been working. If that question was introduced later on, then that. That is not a good question to introduce in an interview in the first place. If you want to do that, you follow up and you run a large scale survey with, I don't know, random sampling or something like that. Uh, and, and then you get good data on uh, how long people have been around for. Uh, but I, I think that's never the focus with a study like this. That the focus is to uh, describe and understand more than to count. I was going to add, particularly with HCI, there's like general recommendation is to even like avoid including specific numbers with codes sometimes. I mean, it's debated whether that's best or not, but some people take the view that you shouldn't even necessarily use specific numbers because by doing that, you're implying that you're actually like. So they'll say, if I, when I say about half, it's between these percentages. And when I say some, it's between these percentages. And if I say like only a few, it's between these. So that's like the extent to which I think some people take separating it from quantitative things. I, I've seen this, I've seen this very purist argument and I, I, I see the point. I don't know if I entirely agree so let me give you a counter example. I, I, do, I do agree with the essence, but I'll make you a counter example. Um, it's often good practice to enumerate the informants that support a, a particular theme that you're uh, discussing um, because, for re reproducibility purposes, for transparency purposes, right? Because it uh, says that you haven't made it up yourself, but it's rather supported, you know, by by the data you've collected from these uh, informants for ten. Okay, so and the mere act of enumerating those people will result in some themes in you know shorter lists and in some themes in longer lists of informants and participants that support that point. So it seems unavoidable, right? If you want to have transparency, it seems unavoidable that you will end up having lists of varying lengths which which suggest frequencies so I, I don't know how to reconcile these two i'm also myself struggling with this if you have any suggestions please let me know no. <laughs> yeah but but numbers should never be your goal no 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 numbers right it's so like Erase numbers from your mind when you're doing this kind of work. Like, for example, like in the tool that we built, and we wanted to figure out if we really help participants with that feature. So then you have to sort of quantify it. But we found out after they use the tool, we would interview them and then sort of talk. Uh, I, don't, I don't know, but, but like in, in the beginning, we just asked more general questions and we sort of uh, decided to stick with those questions because we didn't want to use them. So, I, um, this is going to be a lengthier discussion, so I, I'd okay. rather not get into this now, but I think um, maybe the most common reason to do a qualitative interview study in the first place is. To, to sort of understand the problem and describe the phenomenon and sort of typically the different variations of, of something to understand the different perspectives about some particular problem, not to quantify their frequency. So, so you know, specifically to your example, uh, a goal would be to describe all of the ways in which 
your uh, tool users uh, liked or hated your tool or all the ways in which it helped or hindered their work without making any claims about which of these occurred more frequently. You would, I think you know, you'd follow that up with a different method and try to get a frequency differently, but not through this interview. The interview would be to describe, to build the theory, to describe the ways in which the tool impacts their work positively and negatively, but not to try to quantify how frequently those happen. But that's exactly the point, because you have a small sample of interviewees to begin with. You, you never know. Like if you only interview 20 people, something appearing once could appear a lot more frequently if you interview more than 20. Yeah. Right, so one out of 20 in a small sample doesn't mean much about overall frequency. Uh, okay, so I guess let's, I was gonna do the uh, Secret Life of Bugs paper, but we're gonna, we're, not, we're gonna do that next time. Yeah, let's see. One question. So this interview were done in Germany and in Switzerland, yeah. right? Where, for example, Brodo, or uh, yes. So my question is, isn't the study by by towards the regulation of these two countries? For example, sex workers in a country that doesn't allow brothels um, may interact with uh, um, technology and the internet in a different way. Uh, sneezing, people sneezing in a classroom makes me anxious every time. I, I'm, I am listening. Uh, yeah. I agree. Um, I think I think that the, um, that remains a limitation of their study, and I think they're actually open about it. I think they do talk about this in the paper about how um, uh, you know the, the, where they sampled participants. Uh, may not generalize to sex workers in general in other countries. So I think, um, I agree with you and, and they, I hope they talk about this. I think they do. Um, and uh, there was no way around this, right? Because otherwise they wouldn't have been able to find them in the first place. Um, so they, you know, a, a study limited to Switzerland and Germany is better than no study, you know, arguably, right? When there's no evidence on this phenomenon at all. Who do we have for the last paper, Ian? Yeah, I have to leave right at 4.30, so could I go like next week or something? Or yeah, we're, we're done now, we can't, we can't, it's over for today. So let's, can we start with you next time? Yeah. I was gonna ask if you don't mind doing yeah, that. No, no problem. All right, um, and we're gonna do the IRB discussion and whatnot. We're gonna do that, that at the beginning next time as well, just cause there was too much ranting. <laughs> I can stop going to each unique. Right. Thanks a lot, Charity. A great uh, summary. And everyone else, I'll see you next time. Remember homework. <laughs>